Music in video games is important. Watch this, I'm about to take this boring ass boat footage and make it good. Ready? Okay, now I'm gonna transport all my 20-something 90s kids to a comfy realm of childhood memories. See, video game music can be especially tricky. With movies, you can have actors incorporate the music into their performance, or have the editor cut to the soundtrack. But in video games, you can't rely on the player to keep in time with the score. For the most part, anyways. Crypt of the Necrodancer, on top of having the best title for anything I've ever heard, only allows movement on the beat of the song, so you have to dance along to the music. And Alan Wake has you using the light show of a gig to kill shadow monsters, so the tide of battle is dictated by the tasty hard rock jams of Poets of the Fall. But as amazing as those are, that kind of stuff is generally relegated to gameplay gimmicks or set pieces, respectively. Typically when it comes to Vidya soundtracks, composers have to be conscious of the atmosphere of the game or location, whether or not the song has to loop, if so, how to make it so the player can listen to it over and over again without wanting to commit a felony. And if you get it right, you can turn this... into this. But fuck it up and, well... Now, obviously there's no one right way to make music good. Like, take Doom and Hotline Miami, for example. Sure, one may have a few more polygon cortex values than the other, but they're both hyper-violent games about moving fast and killing bad guys in the most PG-13 fashion possible. But the soundtracks couldn't be more different. Doom has this in-your-face heavy metal soundtrack that gets the blood pumping as you rip and tear through a mosh pit at the Krushkin Lawn, otherwise known as M. But then Hotline Miami's soundtrack sort of lulls you into an almost calm trance by keeping this really steady beat even as the music around you gets more and more violent, which mirrors how desensitised you become to your own actions. But not all soundtracks are made just to accompany violence, you know? Sometimes video games are about other things, like farming or... Oh, no, actually, violence and farming, that about covers it. Uh, fun fact, the first game with the soundtrack was Space Invaders, which had this sort of military march thud that... It's actually, uh... It's not half bad. Ah. Uh. Oh, wait for the beat to drop, here it comes. Hell yeah, dude! Fun fact about that fun fact... Because the beat keeps in time with the aliens no matter what speed they're going, Space Invaders is also technically the first game to have an adaptive soundtrack. What's really cool about adaptive soundtracks is they adapt the soundtrack to what you do. I am a fucking idiot. Did I actually write that sentence? Adaptive soundtracks adapt the soundtrack. Yeah, real fucking insightful, Tom. You know what? I'm leaving it in. It's a one-man show, baby. No one can tell me nothing. A few examples of this would be Fury, which adds and changes the instruments and beats depending on how far you get into the fight to give off a sense of progression and urgency. Transistor uses the same kind of trick to actually remove urgency by muting the percussion and dampening the music when you stop time and go into the planning phase. It also adds a vocal track of the main character humming along to the music to give off the impression that we're inside her head as she plans out how to control Z some robots. And also in Mario Galaxy, the music changes tempo based on how fast you roll on this ball. And I don't know why it makes me so happy, but God help me, it does. It really makes the game feel like it's being scored specifically to your own actions, because, you know, it is. Pyre even has a bunch of different lyrical variations to the song the bards sing about you at the end of the game, so it changes based on what happened during your playthrough. 
You can also use adaptive soundtracks to give feedback on how or what the player is doing. So like adding or removing instruments or melodies the closer you get to solving a puzzle in Portal 2. Crypt of the Necrodancer has a shopkeeper that starts singing if you're nearby, so you're less likely to trust and pass a shop without realising it. And Devil May Cry 5 lets you know just how hard you're styling on some demons with the absolute banger that is Devil Trigger coming in at high style rankings. I know some of those are more reactive than adaptive, but... I can't believe you would just call me out like that, you... Bitch. I'm sorry for calling you a bitch. Just now. But it's not all hunky dory in the world of adaptive soundtracks. Because they're more fluid than other types of music by nature, they don't tend to be super memorable. I mean, which is easier to sing in your head? This? Or this? Usually, the best way to make a song get stuck in your head is with a strong melody like this one. Or this one. Or this one. But then this dude who scored this game deliberately leaned away from strong melodies in his music and the Silent Hill 2 mixtape is fucking fire. So, you know, what do I know? I'm a drummer, not a musician. But I do know a banger when I hear one. And so do game developers, apparently, because they keep opening their games with some fucking shoes. Like Persona 5's stylized weeb-ass intro to the funkalicious wake up, get up, get out there that just gets you in the mood for flipping through some groovy menus and dating underage anime girls. Or how about the perfectly cheesy 60s Bond song that is Snake Eater from a game I really need to just shut the fuck up about. And you better fucking believe I know all the words to real emotion from Final Fantasy X-2. No, I am not joking. Look, don't get me wrong. X-2 is... It's not good. It, it shits all over the perfect bittersweet ending of X. They take the shy, withdrawn nun character from the last game and turn her into Ariana Grande. And it's got a whole bunch of weird Japanisms that never fail to disappoint. And yet, somehow always manage to surprise. But I am sick of everyone pretending that this song doesn't fucking slap. YRP for life, let's go girls! My point is, as well as strong melodies, a good way to make your video game music memorable is just with a sick opening cutscene. Because you know what they say about first impressions? They make a fool out of you and me. What? Sometimes developers can sort of cheat by using licensed music to stand out, but that doesn't make them any less memorable. Things like getting into wasteland shenanigans to some old-timey jams and fallout. Standing unshaken in Red Dead Redemption 2. Or even a merry car-pushing sesh with the boys to some Florence and the Machine in Final Fantasy XV. That last one is especially cool, because they throw in the classic opening prelude on top of the licensed music, just in case you forgot what game you're playing. When the night has come, and the land is dark. It has the advantage of being able to use an iconic tune to invoke a sense of nostalgia and new beginnings, while also being Stand By Me. And I think that's my favourite way of making a song really stand out. You know, with, like, recurring tunes. I think they're technically called leitmotifs, but I'm not 100% sure what that actually means, because I'm not a fucking nerd. But you know what I mean. Seth Everman has a great video where he makes up, like, generic video game music, and it's really funny, I'll leave a link in the thing if you haven't seen it. But there's this bit where he makes up something for an air level, an earth level, a water level, and a fire level. And then when he's doing the music for the hypothetical last boss, he uses those themes to tie it all together.
Like, this method is so effective on such a fundamental level, it works even when you're taking the piss. I think this kind of stuff is used most effectively when you take the chord progression from one theme and alter it to have an entirely different feel. Take Yuna's theme from 10-2. It has a good soundtrack, okay? In this game, Yuna has kind of grown into this outgoing, bubbly personality, and her theme is written to reflect that. But for the more sombre moments, they take that song and shift the key down from A major to A minor, and ditch the funky pop synth for a lonely piano. This one feels much more melancholic, or despondent, or some other third synonym, but it's still distinctly tied to Yuna. Undertale does this stuff all the time. Like, of the 101 songs in its soundtrack, only something like 12 of them don't have any musical connection to another song. You'll have a hard time forgetting the main theme of the game, because you just keep hearing it everywhere. Breath of the Wild takes a more holistic approach, by taking the soundtracks from previous games which most of us grew up with. And then stripping them down to whispers of a time long forgotten. Music in video games is important. Even though I've never grown out of a series harder than I did with Kingdom Hearts, I'll still never forget holding my phone up to the TV speakers as a kid so I could record the title music and use it as my ringtone. And I think my favourite weapon in any video game ever is the mysterious Magnum from New Vegas, which is just like any other gun, except it plays this goofy cowboy guitar twang whenever you whip it out. I hope this video was at least a small bit insightful on the different ways that video games can use music effectively, but truth be told, I just wanted an excuse to talk about Real Emotion from 10-2. It's fucking sick, okay? I'd really love to know some of your favourite video bangers, especially shit from your childhood, so please leave me some links in the comments, or you can get at me directly on twitter.com. If you like this video, then you should feel truly ashamed of yourself. But also, smash that subscribe button and hit the bell and all that other YouTube shit. So you can join us next time when our topic will be... Literally just 12 and a half minutes of me saying the N-word. Oh, yikes.